question. All righty. So welcome to those of you who are just joining us. Uh, just hang tight for a few minutes while we let people uh, log on. Which normally, oh, there it is down there. For those of you who are just joining us, just hang tight for a minute or two while we let other folks join on and then we'll go ahead and get started. Some weird noise outside, so I decided to close my window. Um, okay, I think we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, hi, uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome, and returns, of course, welcome back. Um, my name is Hillary Godwin, and I'm Dean of the University of Washington School of Public Health. Um, welcome to what is now our bi-weekly webinar on COVID-19 and um, both the universities and our school's response to the pandemic. And um, I, before we continue, I'd like to acknowledge that even though we are spread out um, over different places uh, due to the pandemic and because it's summer um, and are meeting via Zoom, that uh, many of us are joining from um, Indigenous lands. And in Seattle, where I live, um, I would like to recognize the Coast Salish people of this land, the Suquamish, Tulalish, to Lalip, Duwamish, and Muckleshoot Nations, and um, honor the people who are still here and on whose lands we are guests. This is our 21st webinar, believe it or not, since the pandemic began, um, which seems like a lot. Um, in general, these webinars are designed to keep our community informed and connected as we work and study remotely. Um, but we uh, also um, welcome any alumni or members of our extended UW community um, that are joining us today. And um, I guess normally I give updates and so I offer the disclaimer that if I, we talk about policies, they're specific to the school. So if you're primary in another school or in another organization, be sure to uh, check with your supervisors about whether or not they refer to you. We're actually gonna try and skip um, most of the announcements will just have a really abbreviated announcement section. Um, this time, um, so a few things that may be specific to us, but um, hopefully relevant to most people. So as a housekeeping reminder, and as you can see on your screen, we don't use the uh, chat box, we use the Q&A window. Um, if we have general um, resources or links that we want to make available to everybody, we'll put them in the chat box. But otherwise, if you have questions or things that you would like clarified, um, please use the Q&A window. And if there's a specific presenter that you'd like to respond to something, you can indicate who that person is. That's great. But if not, we'll, we'll figure it out. Um, and today's topic is a great example of, of something that I've been sort of um, asking that all of us do, which is to sort of raise our sights from the chaos of the moment um, and the ever-changing landscape of COVID and start thinking about the, uh, the reality that um, we're probably going to be in this COVID situation for at least another year, if not two. And so there are other really important things that we need to plan for and we need to be working on um, equally important initiatives around race and equity. And so that's what we're going to focus on for today. So um, this summer we've had just 
a huge effort on the part of the EDI committee for the school and then EDI committees and, and stakeholders uh, in specific departments. Um, and joining us for our conversation today um, are folks from the Department of Epidemiology um, who have been working on a great tool, which um, Victoria is going to tell you a little bit more about. So um, in addition to them, who I'm going to introduce in just a second, um, we also have Kiri Farquhar, our uh, Vice Dean for Education, um, who will give a little bit of, of, of an update. Um, Lisa Manhart, who's our uh, Associate Dean for uh, Research, who is going to give you a couple of critical pieces of information. And then Victoria Gardner, our Assistant Dean for Equity, Diversity and Inclusion and Clinical Assistant Professor in Health Services. And Awa Kone, who um, we we're thrilled to have as our co-chair of the SPH EDI Committee and a Clinical Assistant Professor in Global Health. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lisa in just a second, um, but I also wanted to give a brief introduction to our three panelists that are joining us today. They are Anjem Hajat and Christine Kajrapur, who are both assistant professors in the Department of Epidemiology, and Jesse Seiler, who's a PhD student, an RA, and an EDI committee member in that department. And um, it, they've developed some really great tools, um, and so I'm excited to have them share them with you. Um, I guess I'll just call out that there's other great work that's going on across the school um, in the area of EDI. This, this has been a lot of activity this summer in particular. And so if there are other topics related to this that people want to call out or other projects that people want to lift up, let us know. We're happy to focus on those um, for future webinars. But this is one where I really felt like the work that they were doing was very timely as we were all sort of thinking about how to re-envision our curriculum for the fall um, and ensure that as we emerge from um, COVID that we are emerging as a stronger and better organization. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Lisa to give her announcements and then she will turn it over to Carrie. Great, thank you, Hillary. Um, I have just one announcement um, and I'm really excited about it because the long awaited updated criteria from the Human Subjects Division about uh, how to determine when in-person human subjects activities can resume um, was finally released last week. I just wanna make sure everyone is aware of it. Um, it is, uh, I think it's um, good news for many of us. All of the previously allowed in-person activities remain allowable, and this new tool um, may allow additional studies to restart. Um, it's a really nice approach. It's a shift from categorizing research to an, um, a calculation of a risk score um, approach that incorporates the local epidemiology of COVID-19 the specific study population, and what types of interactions occur between participants and study staff. Um, I will include links to the summary of the update and the risk score tool in um, the key takeaways that are posted on the website. And of course, you can always find the information on the Human Subjects website. Um, my final parting comment is that um, this is a new tool and Human Subjects does anticipate making adjustments. So um, as you use it, please let them know and me know um, if you have any suggestions to make it more effective. That's all. Great. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Lisa. So I will take it from here. Um, I have uh, two updates uh, before I introduce uh, our first uh, speakers. The first is that the school has hired a new TA, William Sang, who's in the Department of Epidemiology and a graduate student, and he will be supporting uh, online learning in the school and specifically providing one-on-one -on -one support uh, for faculty as uh, they, we, transition courses to being online. Support will be for instructional design as well as for the technological aspects of teaching online. His primary responsibility is to work with the faculty uh, to get courses online using the best pedagogical approaches enable these classes to run uh, smoothly. However, he will also be supporting uh, students to troubleshoot any remote learning challenges once the quarter begins. 
And the good news is, as of yesterday, he's available for consults. Uh, and we have an email, spha at uw.edu. Um, I'll be sending out uh, an announcement about this to all of the autumn instructors. And I'm really hoping you'll take advantage of uh, his uh, ability to, to work with you. So my second announcement is uh, to encourage all instructors, students uh, to check out the online learning support canvas page. It's now linked to the SPH faculty and student resources website. You'll find uh, online teaching and learning best practices and training opportunities on that site, including one uh, that is being offered next Thursday by the Department of Global Health. It's a webinar and it it's uh, sharing lessons learned from spring quarter, and it's open to all SPH faculty. And I've heard that it's not only talking about online learning, but it is also talking about uh, equity, diversity, inclusion, and anti-racist uh, principles and how those need to be incorporated and can be incorporated. Um, so that concludes my updates. I am uh, really excited to see uh, so many of you uh, here. and. Uh, I feel like this is a, not just an important, but really timely webinar. The, uh, the fall quarter starts in six weeks. And uh, these are just incredibly uh, important issues that we need to work together to address. So to kick this off, um, I'd like to turn it over to Victoria Gardner, who was previously introduced, but I'll just reintroduce quickly since some may have just joined. Uh, she's our Assistant Dean uh, for Equity, Diversity and Inclusion and a Clinical Assistant Professor in Health Services. She um, is also co-chair of the school's uh, EDI committee. Awa Kone will also be uh, joining Victoria and making some initial uh, remarks to kind of frame this session that we're having. Uh, uh, Awa is a clinical assistant professor in global health and co-chair of the SPH EDI committee. Um, so thank you, two of you. I'll pass off to you uh, to describe some of your plans for this autumn quarter. Great, thank you so much, Carrie um, and Lisa and Hillary for having us today. Um, welcome everybody, greetings from Beacon Hill. I mean, that's where I am today. Um, and today, I think I'm going to, I was going to start us off by giving you a short update of where we are on our anti-racism training proposal uh, and, and uh, our timeline for that. And then I'll come back and talk a little bit more about the session you're about to hear. So, Awa, you want to start off? Yes. Great. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Thank you very much, Victoria. And I also like to thank the team. I'm happy to be uh, here today on this uh, session. Before we start, I would like to, uh, for all of us to take just a minute to really ground ourselves. As Carrie said, the conversation that we're going to have is on a very difficult topic, very important matter, but that can be very, very complicated and very difficult and very emotional. So I think that it's important to ground ourselves to train our mind so that we can really engage in the conversation that is to come and to commit, to really commit to doing our part in dismantling racism, inequality, and uh, so forth. So we'll stop and we'll take three deep breaths and then I will continue. Okay, as um, the background, as uh, Hillary said, and uh, so the SPI, EDI has been tasked to develop a recurring anti-racism training program for the school, something that will um, include student, faculty, and staff. This is the background. The request was prompted by a petition that was signed by over 300 students should be noted that's not the first time in the last few years that we do get, uh, that we did get such uh, expressed demand from students. But this particular one came and requesting some uh, recurrent anti-racism training starting this uh, coming academic uh, year. As a result, we were tasked to develop such a program. Over the past few months, the EDI team has worked actively with committee members student, again, faculty and staff, 
to come up with what we believe is an effective anti-racism tra training package and what are the key elements that such package should include. So Rookie, Victoria and I are now reviewing and drafting training modules that we hope we'll present to the Dean in the next few weeks. And after her review and uh, approval and all that, then we hope that the training will start this fall. Uh, Victoria, you were talk, talking about timeline. So timeline, what we're thinking more like uh, November, if possible, to start those. And there will be some training that will be uh, monthly and um, some that we envision will be quarterly, but some that we really continue over, over the, the, the year. We envision that it will require quite a bit of commitment from all of us, from the department, from the, the, the school, from staff and all, because this is such a complicated and very needed work that needs to be done, that you can't just do it in a one hour, two hours. So we all will need to really commit to really doing it. That means devoting the time. So we will uh, present a timeline and uh, a schedule, proposed schedule to, to the Dean and then um, the detail will be provided later as it's approved. As I say, anti-racism work is complex and it's a lifetime battle for some of us, especially given the nature of our country, our school and institutions where we have so many racist individuals that we're dealing with and that our racist systems and policy are really defining everything that we do. So it's really ongoing work. And our school, we know our school is predominantly white and um, racism is alive on our campus, on our in our classes and also in our offices. So we believe that by working together, we can really, really make a dent in this. And we should also say that we acknowledge that Training is not enough. Training is only the beginning. You got to follow that with action, commitment, things that really, really will lead to changing the climate for all of us, students, staff, and, and faculty. And we are all racist in one way or the other. We have racist thoughts. We have, we engage in racist behaviors. Some people are more targets than agents. Otherwise, we all are in this battle. We all need to really commit to, to engaging in it. What we are proposing is a training module that we call community-based approach. And that means that there will be a package of training that will work with uh, individuals. So at each individual level, change will need to happen, which means that we'll need to acquire some more knowledge, improve our skills, and uh, lead to, to some actions. Also, the second phase is what we call interpersonal level, which means that would include affinity groups, group meetings, that will include maybe group uh, meeting among uh, faculty, meeting among staff, students, so interpersonal, I would say, and the large systemic, the systemic level. So change will have to happen. Training, we hope, will touch on all those three levels and eventually lead to change, lead to action that we can all say that we are definitely making uh, some improvement on our, on our campus. So we are also working with um, centers, uh, school, school, school of public health centers to come up with ways to track and monitor the, the uh, training and changes that we hope to see. So those tools and all that, we just started those conversations and uh, we will hopefully refine those uh, or develop those further as we go on. So in a nutshell, this is really what we have been working on. The, the EDI, SPH EDI committee has been working on specifically to the anti-racism uh, uh, training. Victoria, mm -hmm. I think that's all I wanted to share. Thank you so much. And thanks for having us do that deep breathing. That's so helpful. Um, like you said, it's very stressful work and we need all the time and all the space to ground ourselves in the work that we need to do, as you said. So thank you so much for sharing 
um, you know, the details or as much of the details as, as we can. Um, as we uh, move forward to the next part of our webinar, um, you know, it very much relates to what you were talking about, Awa, in terms of action and how are we doing this in the work that we're doing. And so we're so happy that we have three folks from EPI who have done some work around this. Um, and I also want to thank the EDI committees because I think that the EDI committees have been working really hard in the departments and it is through their process and through their frameworks that these kinds of innovations that Anjum, Jesse and Christine are offering us come through. So, you know, we, we have mechanisms to bring forth ideas and actions and, you know, feel free to connect with your EDI committee folks uh, in your departments to continue to engage in these challenging um, work and how we challenge ourselves. And as instructional leaders, I'm, I'm very happy to, uh, to welcome the input and the contributions of all of our faculty uh, in improving our EDI climate uh, in the classroom and um, you know, pushing ourselves to be better in the classroom. Um, following this session today, I also want to let you all know that I am available for um, online consultation afterwards tomorrow. Um, I'm available from 10 to 12. I'll be on Zoom. My um, I, meeting ID is people power, one word. So just go to people power. I'll be there. If you have a quick question, I'm happy to answer it. If you have a confusing something that you want to tackle, I'm happy to talk through it. Um, so um, please come and, and uh, ask uh, or stop in and visit from 10 to 12 tomorrow on People Power on Zoom. And I'm happy to be uh, of service to you. So I'll stop right there and uh, turn it over to Carrie so we can move on with the presentation. Excellent. Thank you, Awa. Thank you, Victoria. Um, really appreciate your kind of framing this next part of the discussion. Uh, your emphasis on action, I'd say, is incredibly appropriate because that's really what this, this group in epidemiology has done is create like, tools and materials, you know, ways for our faculty to actually act now and adapt syllabi, you know, make changes in the classroom uh, that will address uh, anti-racist issues and also in EDI. So I will just mention that many of these materials we will be able to put um, on that the SPH faculty resources page, which has a tab now for uh, teaching resources. So after the session, or if you have to leave in the middle of the session, uh, take a look at that page. They're not there yet, but uh, we will be getting them uh, there because as you'll see, they're, they're, I won't say dense, but there's a lot in them. So don't feel like you have to capture it all right now. Although this session is recorded, as you also know. So let me now express my uh, deep appreciation for our three guest speakers and uh, introduce uh, Anjum Hajat, who's an assistant professor in epidemiology, uh, Christine Kazerpour, assistant professor in epidemiology, and uh, Jessie Seiler, who's a PhD student, also in epidemiology. She's an EDI committee member and uh, a research assistant for START as well. So I'm gonna just pass it off to the, the three of you. Thank you. Great, thank you uh, for having us. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to share uh, some of the work that we've been doing. Um, so Jessie is gonna sh uh, share her screen, oh, she's fast, um, with the document that we produced. So just a little bit of background on this. Um, so this actually came from a, a, you know, sort of a mix between uh, discussions that were ongoing in epidemiology uh, with the EDR, internal EDI committee, uh, as well as with the curriculum committee. So both um, Christine and I sit on the curriculum committee, which is sort of how we got involved with this uh, project specifically. And we thought, you know, it would be really helpful. We've talked a lot about the need to incorporate uh, EDI principles and anti-racist uh, pedagogy into our teaching. Uh, but we thought it would be really important to provide some, some real uh, tangible guidance to instructors who may not have a lot of experience with doing this. So that's, that was sort of what we aimed to do. Um, and if, of course, we're happy to share, as um, Carrie mentioned, it'll, this stuff is all available. But we do encourage other departments to, you know, feel free to adapt these materials to better suit your needs. Um, I imagine there would be sort of different uh, things across departments maybe that, that could, you know, be honed in on more specifically. So, 
as a reminder, we did really create this with uh, epidemiology in mind. So, and just a little framing, um, you know, the process of, of incorporating anti-racist principles and EDI um, into the classroom, we believe is uh, a slow process and sort of a long-term process. Uh, it's not that you're gonna, you know, fix up the reading list, change a couple things here and there, and you're done with it. We do believe that this is a, a continual process, and you'll see that reflected in some of these materials uh, here. Um, so with that in mind, you know, people can sort of move forward at, at sort of their own pace. And we do also realize that people are at different sort of places in the process of incorporating these principles into their teaching. Uh, secondly, I think it's also really important to note that others, both in our department and across the school, are doing this uh, type of thing very effectively in their coursework already. Uh, so hopefully you can identify folks that you know that are doing this, uh, incorporating EDI and anti-racist uh, pedagogy into their teaching uh, to potentially also provide assistance. But we do have um, uh, others uh, in the department, uh, Victoria and others, that can provide assistance as well. So there are resources out there. Um, and lastly, we are looking, so we won't talk for too long, but we are really looking for some feedback from all of you about how this can be improved, what else it needs, what are we missing, uh, that sort of thing. We are thinking about this as very much a living and breathing document. All right, so I'll jump into it. So here what you're seeing on the screen um, is the document itself. So we've broken it up into three sections. I'll talk about the first two. The first is modifying course materials. So there are several suggestions here um, that I can walk through. So the first, and I think this is an important one, is placing your course materials into historical context. Um, so, you know, the many of the methods we use uh, in epidemiology specifically, but I imagine throughout the School of Public Health, are really grounded in uh, Western uh, and European thinking. Uh, we don't often see a lot of, um, you know, other ideologies, Southern ideologies, Eastern ideologies represented in our teaching. Uh, one exception, of course, is CBPR, uh, the Community-Based Participatory Research or Engaged Research, which is really rooted in critical theory um, and have began in, in Latin America and has sort of a, a, a non-European approach. Uh, but it's important to, to notice or to, to really um, acknowledge that, I think, in our coursework is, is we're coming at everything we teach from a very specific um, lens, right? So uh, this is something I'm really learning a lot about. It's super interesting for those of you who I want to learn more. There's actually lots of resources out there. Lots of research on this topic has been done by um, uh, faculty in, in education departments across the nation. So lots of resources that we've actually also posted at the, at the bottom of this um, document too. So the second important thing to note is to be explicit in the classroom uh, about how race and gender are being used, how they're being defined. So in epidemiology, uh, oftentimes, you know, we put race into a model. We don't give it much thought. Uh, but really being clear and explicit about what does it mean? Why is it there? Is it a proxy for racism? Is it a proxy for genetic ancestry or something else? Uh, and this has been made clear by several papers that have been published in the epi literature and probably in, in many of the other fields uh, that it's important to do this. So we you know, further encourage a discussion about that um, when it's appropriate, of course, in your classrooms. The third comment here is around incorporating authors and scholars of color into your classroom examples and into your readings. Um, so, you know, this one uh, is, it feels very tangible to me. Uh, so taking a good solid look at your reading list, at the examples that you use, at the data sets that you use, um, if maybe you can't uh, identify authors of color, thinking about the topics that you're presenting. Uh, there's actually some research that shows students are, are very engaged when uh, the topic of an example, for example, is uh, something to do with social justice, something to do with inequality. Uh, so maybe consider that if it's appropriate, again, in your classroom settings. Uh, but this one we do, again, feel is, is very tangible and something that most people should be able to do uh, with just a, you know, a little bit of work. But again, does require uh, considerable updating every year or so as you, as you continue to, to teach your course. So the next... Um, session here, or the next, sorry, topic here uh, is incorporating examples that deal with racism. And I sort of said this above, the racism and inequality uh, into your work um, and into sort of the papers that you are using as examples in, in your work. Uh, and then the next uh, section is around uh, the whole next section. So those, all those suggestions we have there were around modifying 
um, your, your, your curriculum specifically. The second way to really incorporate anti-racist pedagogy into the classroom is to modify classroom teaching itself. So many of these suggestions are things that people have seen before, that things that people are already doing. Uh, so, and probably you know, seem sort of obvious to some. So learning about your students at the beginning of the quarter. So we know this is clearly harder in larger classrooms, but many people have managed to uh, come up with systems to even learn about large 140, 150 uh, person classes uh, and trying to really get to know your students. Clearly a much easier task in the, in the smaller ones. Uh, smaller classrooms, uh, remembering things like pronouns and pronunciation of students' names. That, that sort of creates, again, this, this inclusivity in that you actually are listening and, and caring about your students. Uh, the second uh, issue here is um, gathering feedback from students about their experience in the class. And this is not meant to be just at the end of the course. Uh, obviously, we all do uh, course evals, but maybe doing this periodically in the middle of the course, three quarters of the way through. And you can do a very simple evaluation. So um, what should we start doing that we're not already doing? What maybe should we stop doing that we are doing that nobody likes? Uh, and what what's working for you? What should we continue to do? So really simple starts, it's a stop, start, continue approach to um, evaluating as you go on uh, through the, the quarter. Another tactic that I know several of us have tried, and this is something that is recommended by our Center for Teaching and Learning in terms of creating an um, inclusive classroom, is this establishment of community norms or ground rules. Uh, so I've tried this in my course and it actually did uh, work quite well, where you sort of, you know, uh, work either with the students, you could do it, or you can do it on your own and share it with the students or sort of a couple different approaches to say sort of what, what are agreed upon norms about how, you know, things should work in this classroom. Um, and this usually uh, is around what do students need from each other? What do they need from their instructor in order to really learn effectively? Uh, and then the next point here is around addressing microaggressions in the classroom. So this can be difficult, uh, clearly. I will note there are several resources around first identifying microaggressions, right? You have to be able to identify it in order to address it. Uh, but once identified, it really must be addressed. We can't let these continue to let these things go um, as has often been the practice of the past. Uh, so again, I do refer you to some short videos on this topic that uh, the UW uh, CTL has, but there are also uh, others that I think we've posted in our resources section here uh, from, from other places. Um, and then this is again another uh, uh, issue related to um, uh, sort of active learning techniques, right? So providing multiple means for students to meet the learning objectives. So, uh, you know, in the past, or at least when I went to college, I remember it was, here's your one exam, your only opportunity to have points, uh, you know, on the, uh, uh, in the class. So clearly not a super inclusive way to, to go about structuring your class. So many different approaches can be used, um, sort of, trying to take different approaches to assessment, I think is important, uh, as well as trying to create more opportunities for inclusion and for um, participation in your class. I mean, that's, I think, oftentimes what we're looking for. So things like the poll everywhere, the think pair shares that many people already use. Uh, random call, we know this is one that we've heard uh, instructors are sort of hesitant to do. It makes uh, students nervous as well, but it has also been shown to be something that really does in uh, in, enhance uh, classroom participation. Uh, and especially in the online environment, it could be, uh, it has been sort of, I know several uh, instructors uh, did experiment with this uh, during last quarter and had found it actually to be quite successful. And of course, small group discussions that many of you are already doing, as well as minute papers. So again, many of the active learning techniques that I think we're all already trying to incorporate are also very good um, examples of, of, of ways to um, increase inclusivity and um, uh, to bring in the anti-racist pedagogy into our classrooms. And I think I turn it over to Jesse from here to talk about long-term strategies. Yeah, okay. Um, so, the long-term goals toward an anti-racist pedagogy in society are, are really intended to help faculty and staff and all of us in this community make bigger changes in our lives, in our curricula, and in our communities. Uh, so these goals, just to frame them for you really quickly before walking through them, they encourage continual growth and they allow faculty to make changes to their approach 
to teaching as they gain an understanding. So I'm going to review each of these briefly. Uh, so for the first one, faculty self-reflection. Faculty are encouraged to read up and think critically about how their race or ethnicity and other aspects of their identity, you know, socioeconomic status, et cetera, have shaped their careers in teaching. We've listed a lot of really excellent resources at the bottom of this page that we'll scroll through, scroll through in a second, um, but it is not a challenge to find good things that address these topics, and I'm sure you all have some that you can think of right off the top of your head. Uh, it's not about indulging in sort of endless self-flagellation, that's not the point. But what we're hoping is that anyone with a position of privilege afforded by their gender identity or skin color, or socioeconomic status, anything else, those folks will take this opportunity to first of all, think through the possibility that their advancement and success has been at the expense of members of marginalized communities. And secondly, to get a clear sense of what that means their obligations are. And thirdly, just to get a clear list of like, okay, here's how I meet those obligations. The analysis we're asking faculty to do um, ought to lead to more developed awareness of social positions, power dynamics, and other related issues, both inside and outside the classroom. And this can be done with students in the classroom too. So a class might help both students and faculty see their identities more clearly. And there's a lot of potential value in that. Um, so here are a couple points about um, both instructors and students engaging in this type of reflection in class relative to the material, which makes sense for public health. Um, and I think that especially because of our field, you know, our field has a, what you could generously call a checkered history when it comes to caring about the health of minoritized and marginalized people. So this is critical for thinking about what the next generation of public health practitioners, um, how they're going to be in the world. Um, and it might help to do this more than once to have this sort of iterative thing where at the beginning of the quarter, here's where my awareness is, and at the end of the quarter, here's my, where my awareness is. Um, so the third part of this sort of longer term process, we're inviting faculty to decenter the authority in the classroom and have students take some responsibility for their learning process. Mm -hmm. And you can see that in the other, in the sort of earlier components as well. Um, but this can involve involving students in crafting the syllabus, the learning objectives, et cetera, other portions of the class. Um, and I think the sort of underlying or the like deeper work here is about actually challenging the harmful components of the power differential created in the classroom. Um, and I'm saying harmful because I think that, uh, you know, we, we, once we get a position of authority, it can be hard to say, I actually don't know the answer to that question, or, oh, you're catching me by surprise. I hadn't thought of it that way before. Um, and that's not good for anyone. No one's ever gotten smarter or better in that type of, um, with that type of response. Um, so trying to undo that power dynamic, uh, I think is gonna be helpful. Um, and then, the so part of one thing that faculty can, can do to further that goal is to include racial content in courses uh, perhaps including materials suggested by students and actually invite students to lead that conversation um, so i think it's common for faculty to not necessarily feel ready to teach material about race to feel like if they say something wrong or do something wrong cancel culture is going to swoop down and like they're never going to get a job in academia again and that's it and i think um, what we can do what we achieve by decentering authority is we say, okay, we are in, we're in, you know, acknowledging that learning is mutual and ongoing and students are here and learning a lot and faculty are here and they're still learning too. Um, so by sort of inviting this, this um, more honest, I would say, engagement with the material that has to be engaged with, um, I think we're kind of getting around cancel culture or at least the toxic parts of it and um, just opening up mutual, the possibility for mutual learning. Um, and then the final component about this is creating a sense of community in the classroom through collaborative learning. So it's one thing to every now and then dip into Think, Pair, Share or do a group project, but the sense of community has to be, you know, a coherent and has to already kind of be there. Um, so thinking about incorporating more active learning techniques um, in order to create that sense of community, I think would be helpful. So just in general about this section, I know it can be hard when you're in a field to really ask naive questions about it, um, especially because our field right now is engaged in a response to an active emergency. And we're all really isolated now in a way that we never have been or maybe never have been before. Um, but this third section is really about helping people, helping faculty ask those naive questions. So are you having a different experience than your peers? 
because of your relative privilege? Are some of your students experiencing hardships that you might have a difficult time comprehending because of your privilege? And they can also be much more grounded in sort of the practicalities of classroom life. Um, so is the material you're teaching, is it really best understood through lectures or is there another way of teaching it that might teach students more thoroughly and better? And I think of these as naive questions because many people already have an intuitive sense of the answers to them or lived experiences that give them a lot of clarity. But taking a naive approach to these questions by asking them with intellectual and emotional honesty, by answering them with rigor, that's gonna help us imagine and build the academic world and the greater community that we really want for ourselves and for the people who will follow us. So, and I, I also just sort of incidentally find that this type of inquiry, this, these naive questions, help me a lot when I'm pushing back on something. Like when I'm pushing back on the idea that my white privilege has got me jobs, got me into rooms, got me into conversations that um, at the expense of um, peers of color. Um, so I think that habit of naive questioning can be a really helpful one to uh, cultivate. And I think that a lot of people in the School of Public Health are probably already doing it. Um, so I'm gonna invite Christine to uh, finish this up. Thank you so much, Jesse and Anjum. So I'm going to walk through sort of the companion document to the document that Jesse was just sharing. So when we were developing um, that sort of guidelines document, we thought it would be also helpful to have a document that, that faculty could use as they're um, getting ready to teach their classes this year, um, to sort of walk through it and and really think about changes that they're making and why they're making changes and what, what changes they need to make. So we developed this, what we're calling a course development plan, which is sort of analogous to an individual development plan or IDP that um, we often have mentees and trainees um, complete in the school. So this is broken into six sections. Many of them are in parallel to the document that Jesse and Anjum just, just described. So um, I'll go through this somewhat briefly. But the first section of this document, and again, sorry, this is intended for, again, faculty to complete as they're getting ready to teach, teach this year, uh, regardless of the quarter that they're teaching. This first section is really intended to be a self-reflection from readings, webinars, videos, or trainings that folks have done. And we often have our students do self-reflections when they do readings. Um, and the idea here is that for um, anti-racism trainings or EDI trainings that we've done or readings that we've done, um, including the recommended book for the school for this year. Um, encourage people to, to reflect a little bit on things that they've learned, what questions remain in their mind, things they don't understand, and how they intend to use this information. And it's just sort of a, a, an opportunity to pause, step back, and really be able to digest and again reflect on, on some, of the, um, some of the new uh, uh, trainings or, or new things that people have, have learned. Um, the second section is, or the next three sections are analogous or in parallel to what Jesse and Anjum went through. So for these next three sections, what we've done is um, put in these little tables, the bullet points that Anjum and Jesse went through, each one of those is its own row in this table. And the idea is for faculty to go through these um, sort of one at a time, think about, am I already doing this in my class? Am I going to do it this year? And again, as this being a course development plan, it's intended to be updated every year. Um, it, I, I don't know if it's realistic to expect faculty to make all of these changes this year, but it's a document that people can update year after year so they can move things hopefully more to the already do column um, a, as they move through uh, teaching, teaching their courses. So this first, uh, excuse me, the second section uh, describes strategies to modify course materials, which is the first thing that Andrum had, had walked through. Um, this third section is strategies to modify classroom teaching that Andrew went through. This is a lot of the active learning um, um, classroom teaching techniques. And this fourth section is the long-term strategies that Jesse just walked through. So all of these sections refer to this section five, um, where we've provided an opportunity for folks to um, in more detail, describe what they're changing to their class, if it's a change to a class material, classroom teaching or long-term strategy, and really what was the motivation for the change. And again, the motivation piece is a bit of self-reflection because we were, didn't want the first part of the document just to be a checklist, right? Like, okay, I do this, okay, I do this, okay, I do this, I'm good. That's not what this is about. 
It's really about incorporating these anti-racism principles to better your class, better the experience for students, and really start dismantling the systematic racism at our university, at our school, and in our teaching, things that we all, that we all do. So in, in hope, with this table, we hope that people can really expand on and have a, a moment or a few lines to reflect why they're making um, the changes that they're making. Um, and then this last section, acknowledging that um, faculty will probably get stuck, right? So there may be things that faculty, and I can think of this examples in my own class, my classes, things that I know I wanna change, but I'm not sure exactly how to change them or what the best approach would be to change them. So we have this section um, for people to make comments about things they wanna change, but they aren't sure how to do them. In the epi department specifically, we've talked about a couple of options about how to um, address these. One of these possibilities is the curriculum committee whom this document will be sent to, at least in the epi department. Um, we'll put these in a Google doc and we invite other faculty and students to chime in um, with some examples or suggestions that they have and it can be anonymous. Um, but that's a way to sort of uh, get a lot of input if people are struggling with how to make changes to their class. We thought that would be a nice way to do it. So I just wanted to mention to just on the epi side, just in case people are curious how, how our process is going to be with this course development plan. So um, we sent um, these documents to epi faculty a couple of weeks ago and are asking our fall quarter instructors to get them back to the curriculum committee by the end of the month. The members of the curriculum committee um, will review this document and along with students as well. So we're going to be inviting students to review these documents and provide input that we can give to the faculty before, um, before this fall. And then again, we'll go through the same process for faculty teaching in winter quarter and faculty teaching in spring quarter. Uh, we, um, we really wanted to provide an opportunity for students, um, particularly students who've taken these classes in the past, but all students to provide, to provide input on some of the changes that, that faculty have made. And we're also curious to hear people's thoughts on um, 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 holding us faculty accountable for these changes. So we've discussed possibilities like posting these course development um, plans on, Can on the Canvas website for the class so that students can go in and see what faculty said that they were going to change um, in the coming year. A again, as a, as a method to really hold us accountable to the changes that we said we were going to make and really to make the best courses uh, possible. So that's the, the course development plan. Um, and I don't know, Andrew, if Jesse, if you had anything else to add or if we wanted to open it up uh, for questions and discussion. Yeah, I didn't have anything else to add, but we can uh, go ahead, Jesse, unless you do um, open it up if people have thoughts, uh, changes, improvements. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Andrew, Jesse, Christine. Uh, lots of material there. Um, maybe I'll, I'll kick it off as we wait for the audience to ask questions. I have two, there are two questions I guess I, I have um, related, uh, which are, there are certain elements that we, the school has discussed uh, including into the syllabus already, and, and Victoria may speak a little more on that. There's a, a climate statement and then some statements on equity, diversity, inclusion that you know, the school is very strongly encouraging everybody to incorporate into their syllabus and, and some departments actually require it. And I know, you know, we usually, I co-instruct a lot of classes, so I say we um, usually read that out at the beginning of class and it, it sets that tone. My first question is, is that something you would recommend doing? And if so, or if not, why not? Um, and then the second is around, uh, getting diverse kind of perspectives and, and voices into the classroom. Because, um, you know, we do have a lot of white instructors and uh, it is important to have people of color coming into the classroom and sharing their uh, viewpoints. So what would be your, your thoughts on that? And uh, I think Victoria might have something to, to add on, on that as well. So we can first maybe turn to you, the panelists, and then Victoria, if you want to add in after they speak, that would be fantastic. Yeah, um, so in terms of, Carrie, your first uh, part of their question, I'll just say, if I, I fully support, you know, adding those, um, uh, the diversity statement, the classroom climate statements to our syllabus. 
I mean, we do run the risk that students are not reading those things. <laughs> so, you know, we want to be clear about that we support that stuff maybe in, in the beginning of class. Um, so, yeah, definitely uh, important to, as a, another way to signal uh, that this stuff is really important to me as an instructor. Um, and then in terms of bringing in uh, other, you know, speakers of color and other people into the classroom, uh, clearly, you know, if your course is designed that way with guest speakers in mind or with, a, you know, however, however that's designed, that would be great. The other sort of thing that I do a lot is a little tip that I learned. Um, maybe I'm lecturing, but I'm using material from, uh, you know, I teach some stuff uh, from some the theory work from W.E.B. Du Bois, for example. So I put his picture up on my slide. So everybody is very, is very sort of intentional, cognizant way to say, you know, we're incorporating people uh, from different perspectives into the readings and into the discussion uh, that we are uh, about to have. So just a tip if you're not actually bringing physically people into your classroom setting. Can I? The other two, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say about including this information in the syllabus. Yeah, I think it's critical. And I, I've been thinking a lot about this because I'm not sure that something written in classroom expectations, uh, in the classroom expectations of a syllabus has ever changed my behavior in a classroom. But I'm also like maybe just a rude person. So I don't know how. So I'm doing some self-reflection on that. But it occurs to me that like faculty need that section in their syllabuses now because they need to be able to say things like, hey, I know you might be unable to turn your camera on because of your level of comfort, that's no problem. Or like, hey, I know you're learning and you're trying your best. And that that means that like your dog is sitting on your lap and you're on the floor because you're having a bad day and that's no problem too. So I imagine that this portion of the syllabus is actually gonna look really radically different for faculty this fall. Um, and so I think that students are gonna see that section of the syllabus now as more of a living document. Honestly, it felt a little copy paste and like we have to put this here because of a university bylaw. Um, so now I think just seeing faculty actually actively reflect about what they want their classroom to feel like for students who are undergoing crisis, and, you know, in this emergency, and you know, and acknowledging also that faculty are also having emergencies. Um, I think that we're going to treat it differently. Um, so yeah, I, I I encourage not only putting it in your syllabuses but calling it out really explicitly on day one. Um, yeah. Thank you. Oh, sorry, can I just, I want, Andrew, not to put you on the spot, but I haven't done the community norms in my class before. I'm going to, but I know you have in the past. How do you, do you feel like, could you explain that process a little bit more for people who haven't done it and maybe how that, um, that's more of an active way, not to operationalize that statement, but, but maybe just a different way. Um, to yeah. Sure. So what I've done in the class is just, you know, it's the first day of class where do we, we I have a small class. I teach Epi 548, which is around, you know, 25, 30, 30 students. So we go around, introduce ourselves. And then, you know, I open up the discussion. So what do you need to learn uh, in this, in the, what, what is, what do you need to learn essentially from your peers and from me? And we put it up on the whiteboards. This is when we were in class last year and people would, you know, jot something down and then others would come and endorse them with check marks, right? So everybody in the classroom stood up uh, except for maybe one person. So, you know, you're gonna have that for sure uh, who was not interested in participating but mostly people were very engaged and sort of walking around the classroom reading what others had, had um, already posted and either endorsing them or adding to them. So I, I found it to be a, a successful way to, um, you know, really engage the course, the, the classrooms in the, on the very first day and set that norm at the beginning. I would, I would, that's a great suggestion. Um, you know, there's a function on your Zoom called annotation where you can actually um, write on the screen and you can then maybe build your norms from there. But that's, that's an excellent um, suggestion and question. Um, the other thing on the statements that I would add that you want to make sure your students know about is the bias concern reporting um, tool. There's two, those are also embedded in the syllabus statement um, copies that you all got. So there's the DC info, which is not anonymous. Um, and I can, you know, talk to them and find out more. And there's the anonymous one where I really don't know who reported it. And those are also um, 
you know, things, ways that I find out what's going on and we can address them. So those are both in the syllabus and those should be on your syllabus. And if nothing else, feel free to call that to your students' attention so they know that those mechanisms exist. Victoria, do you want to talk to the, the community guest speakers and what we're doing? Yeah. Frank, that's really also a ton of questions that are up on the okay. 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 I want to make sure that you guys okay. see. Okay. Uh, let's see, what are those? Mm -hmm. I might just add though, just because I, I think this is important and it's re related to equity is that the School of Public Health will be providing an honorarium for those individuals mm -hmm. who are coming to do you know, presentations or, or right. you know, teach our students. So yeah, it's not a matter of inviting someone and then having them do something that's not, you're not being compensated for that. And that's something new that Victoria has been working on and mm -hmm. we'll soon be put into action. Right, we'll be, uh, Liz um, is helping us figure out how to, how to distribute those funds and how we can uh, make it accessible to the instructors um, so that you do have that option of being able to compensate your uh, community speakers and uh, non-UW people to participate uh, in, in your classrooms. Um, do you want me to do the questions, Carrie? Or sure, yeah, go for it. I, I have them in front of me, but you go ahead. Uh, Susan said, I understand that SPH will have an EDI dashboard online. Will any outcomes from the course development plans be included in the dashboard? That's a good question. You know, I think, um, do you think it should be? <laughs> I think so. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, these course development plans are going to be resources for other faculty as well. Um, so if I'm a faculty and I'm like, wait, I don't know how to do this. I'm going to my trusted faculty peers uh, for, and this sounds like a way to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I really, second question is, I really appreciate that you've developed criteria and a process for faculty to work through and for them to be accountable and wrestle with their own courses versus having a committee or a staff member go through all the syllabi to make them diverse. So yeah, definitely a uh, uh, helpful tip how you've structured it. So thank you for that question, <laughs> comment. Um, a, con a question from Renee, could there, should there be a SPH-wide intro slide deck for courses that include a land acknowledgement, statements about course environment, incident bias reporting, et cetera, so that professors can share similar information rather than just putting it on the syllabus where it may not be seen. Um, I think that's a great idea. Um, you know, it may be more than one slide uh, and if there's a way to, for, for us to send that to you or someone to do that? How do you think that would work best? What's a good way to do that? Something we could put up on the, the resource um, site. So I think just sort of making, uh, making a note of it, um, but that, that seems that's a great suggestion. Okay. Uh, next question, Sarah Nelson, are the statements that are being discussed here in this link and here. Yes, I would say yes to that. Statements. I think uh, they're embedded in there. Um, so some are required and some are strongly encouraged and recommended. Thank you to Anjum, Jesse, and Christine for developing these resources. I think I probably missed this, but when will these documents be available? So Carrie had mentioned she will place them, I can't remember where exactly, but well, that'll be after this sometime? Yes, we can put them with your permission, just yes, as we are, with the Department of Epidemiology fully acknowledged. Uh, and they'll go on the faculty resources page. It's not the same page as those syllabi, but uh, um, is a page you, reach, you access it through the SPH faculty page. They'll say teaching resources and we'll put a separate link on that. And we'll make sure we always post for the webinars the key takeaways and we'll make sure that the link for that is in the key takeaways so people can find it later if they forget where it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Kate Hutton on behalf of Juanita, Kate Hutton McConnell on behalf of 
Juanita Ricks, who cannot type into the Q&A. Haya, an ongoing issue we struggle with around equity is that some students have a real fear around publicly challenging their faculty. Your thoughts? Um, yeah, for sure, yes. Um, and I think that it's important to acknowledge that uh, we fear that because we're afraid that we won't have a future in the field we love if you get angry at us. Uh, so just to like really make it explicit what we're afraid about. It's and I think long. that the problem there is that, um, well, this change needs to come from faculty, right? Which means it needs to be an entire community-based thing. Um, and that's why I think that decenter, decentering authority in the classroom is such a critical component of this. Um, we really need faculty to say, I am confused by this. I don't understand this. We need them to model that behavior a lot every time they're confused by something. Um, and uh, I think that will make faculty more approachable. And it'll also give faculty this habit of mind of being you know, more generous too, I think, with students' confusion. And students, you know, when faculty, I just found out that faculty don't always read pre-reads for faculty meetings. And may, that made me feel better about not always reading the syllabus, but also made me be like, why am I sometimes yelled at for not reading the syllabus? So I think that, you know, we just, we, we need some introspection around all this and it does need to come from the faculty. Also mm -hmm. students, if you ever have a thing that you want to raise to faculty and you're not sure how, let me know. I, I don't know if I care about my future anymore. So I'll just <laughs> say, you know, I'm like volunteer to just say stuff. I don't care. Yeah. Um, it's also okay to to uh, post these questions privately. You can come up to your instructor, come up, you know, um, online and just say, you know, something you said uh, made me think about such and such. And um, to remember to focus on the behavior and the comments and not the person themselves, um, because then that way you're um, staying away from that taking it personally kind of, you know, reaction and faculty and anyone, you know, um, definitely does better when you critique the behavior um, or the words and not necessarily the person. So uh, that can be a very helpful way to navigate through these difficult conversations. So guys, um, we are at four o'clock. Um, and if you are willing to stay on and answer more questions, that would be awesome, but I just wanted to acknowledge that there are people who are probably going to start dropping off because they probably have other Zoom calls or other things that they have to do. Mm -hmm. um, but, and to thank you so much. This was such a, both a great presentation and also just really great work that you did, just to echo what some of the, the commenters wrote about that, just to have these really concrete guidelines is so, so, so helpful in the list of resources. So for those of you who want to stay on, um, and if our panelists are willing to stay on, I think we could do, do some more questions and have a little bit more discussion, but I also just want to recognize that some people are going to be signing off. And also tomorrow, um, people power on Zoom. If you have questions that can't be answered today, I'm happy to connect with you tomorrow. Thank you, everybody. So the what question were we on here? Uh, Anonymous attendee, how can we make sure guest speakers know and follow the classroom norms? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a good question. I would um, just give it to them, you know, because <laughs> you're clearly going to be like, hey, what day are you coming? You're coming on this day. FYI, I do this norms thing. Mm -hmm. um, please take a look at it. Uh, it's really important to me as an instructor and my class really seems to appreciate it too. So mm -hmm. this is our if I may add to Andrew's question the workshop that Deepa and I teach we definitely do that when there's a guest uh, speaker or whether the person is invited by one of us faculty or student if it's by a student we make sure that the student conveys the class norm to the the guest speaker we make sure to also talk to and it does help definitely mm-hmm mm -hmm. yeah um next question susan graham oh india said i like that idea renee i'm not sure <laughs> susan graham says what do you think should be the role of the school's curriculum committee in this process could that be a way to reduce variability across departments in uptake and implementation thank you does anyone have any thoughts on that i would say yes i think cpc <laughs> could do that and i'll talk to liz kirk and we'll see what more we can do. And I know Susan is on the CPC, so it sounds like a very important discussion for that group to have. Mm -hmm. Cool. Do SBH staff teaching at other institutions have access to these materials and resources? 
I would think so if you are linked to the UW Net ID that you have as a UW staff person. Um, Wasn't this question about public health other institutions like other schools? Yeah, at other schools. Oh, oh. oh. Hmm. Hmm. I, I don't know about that. I don't I know how they the would know about it. Open, right? Right? Well, so if they're on uh, on this call or watching this call, um, then probably they have a oh. net ID, which is I think how they logged on. Um, but if you don't and you want access to it, now you know the names of the folks who developed it, and so you can probably reach out to them. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Okay. And could the announcement also go to staff? I'm not sure which announcement. It might be the an announcement about these resources being on the website. Okay. Uh, oh. I think I was asked how would and I responded by typing in an answer. How would these get out to people who aren't an EPI or aren't actually on this uh, particular webinar? And I will send out an, an announcement um, at some point once we get everything all lined up. But and soon we enough. Also say that, um, the documents were also created with the TAs in mind. They're clearly in integral and critical part of all of our course teaching. So. Mm -hmm. Excellent point. Thank you. Susan also says we also need students on at CEPC. Mm -hmm. For some reason, I thought we did. Well, um, we do. We, we, have them. we have a spots for student yeah. reps, and it's sometimes hard to recruit them. Yeah. But I want to give a shout out to Ruki and Juanita, who have developed this um, call for students to be on the Dean's Advisory Council. <clears throat> and they went and found out all the different school wide committees that want, have student reps and included um, places for people to sign up for those. So we're hoping to get student reps identified for all those committees this summer. So if you're a student, please sign up. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And Kate asks, in addition to faculty and staff, could the announcement also go to TAs or could faculty be required to share with their teaching team? Um, yes, Carrie? <laughs> yes, the answer is yes. Uh -huh. I, if I can find a way, that I'll figure out to talk to Juanita. She's my resource for that. <laughs> yeah. And those are all the questions that I have. Can I add a point to that last one about TAs? So my RA ship, the folks who employ me over the summer, um, said, hey, we will pay you to do four hours of reading and introspection around anti-racism work. And then also organize small groups and stuff uh, to like talk about those materials. Um, and I don't want to be like, okay, it's an important thing to pay students to do things, but it is important to pay us to do things. We are broke. And, you know, it also commit, it also demonstrates the commitment of the um, institution to, uh, you know, to doing anti-racist work. So I think if you hire TAs or RAs for something, um, it could really help for you to say, hey, here are some resources. We're doing anti-racist work in public health now, which means we're doing it in our classroom in the, in the fall. So I'm going to need you to spend four hours this week uh, getting educated. We can have small groups, you know, just like replicating that. I think it could be really, really effective. It needs to be done carefully because you don't want to um, open up, you know, minority students to being, you know, people who have to explain everything to the white students, that type of thing. But like, um, but it can be really effective, I think. Mm -hmm. On that same vein, same thing goes for supervisors of staff as we as we head into the fall and we're asking for people just to echo Ava's comments about this is gonna be a heavy lift for all of us in terms of, uh, of working on these issues. And so supervisors make sure that you are taking that into account with your staff and actually making time on their schedules and readjusting your expectations for other work um, so that they have time to do that. This is not an un, unpaid mandate. It's part of um, of what you should be paying them to be to do. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Anything else? Thank you guys again. This was totally awesome. I did want to echo again, if there are other groups out there who are aware of other projects like this that are going on in other departments, let us know. This was just one of the first ones that I had seen that was so far along and I was like, this is awesome. I wanted to hear more um, and I thought other people would want to hear more as well. You guys are great and um, everyone, hope you have a good two weeks until our, our next get together and uh, cool. be Thanks. well. Yeah, have a great afternoon. Thank, Thank you everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Salamat. All right. Salamat.